Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Someone wave at the back. Great. Oh, well, look, don't worry. These are all really important things, and it has been an amazing morning. It's been great. What a great time of worship. Um, just amazing to hear every, people praying out and hear other people's voices. So keep it coming. Um, this morning, is anyone feeling a bit sheepish? Did anyone have a bad night's sleep? Well, my hope is that what I bring today is useful and not a woolly message. And that you won't all be flocking to the exit. Okay, I'll stop now, I'll stop now. My name is Rob, and if you don't know me, uh, and if you've guessed, I I do like a good pun. So please come and see me after if you know any good ones. Today, we are going to be looking at the next chapter in our Names of God series, which, as you probably guessed, is Jehovah Rohi. Can you say Jehovah Rohi? This means the Lord is my shepherd. And the revelation of this in the Bible can be found in Psalm 23, verse 1, a very famous psalm that we'll be coming back to a bit later. Last week, Carl unpacked our first name of God. Who can remember what it was? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. If you've missed it, I'd thoroughly recommend going back uh, to check it out online. You can listen to it again. In our walk of faith... It's important to know God. And the first thing you do when you meet someone is you get to know their name. Now, how many of us have met someone and immediately forgotten their name? Okay, not just me, that's good. I'm definitely guilty of it. Uh, But knowing someone's name is a good sign that you know them. The name itself is only really the first step, but it's a good indicator to knowing who they are and what they're like. And this is what we're unpacking in this five-week series. And as a useful resource, we have been using a great book called Hallowed Be Thy Names by David Wilkerson. And if you haven't read it, I'd thoroughly recommend giving it a read. It's not a very big book, which I like because I'm not great at reading. It's very accessible. It covers the five names of God that we're, we're going to be looking at, as well as ones that we're not going uh, to be covering. So I'd recommend getting a copy of that. The God of the Bible has many names, and the more we understand them, the more we get to understand him and his ways. So today, we are unpacking our second name of God, Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is our shepherd. My aim today is to answer four simple questions. Why do we need a shepherd? Why is this worth even thinking about? What do we know about the shepherd What does the Bible teach us about the Jehovah Rohi? How do we know whether he is our shepherd? And finally, what what should we do about it? So, why do we need a shepherd? The first verse I want to draw attention to is Isaiah 53, verse 6, which says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Did you know the Bible refers to us as sheep over 500 times, more than any other animal? And there are references to this in over half of the books in the Bible. I can already tell some of you are not happy that I'm referring to you as sheep. Uh, But if you're anything like me, you can probably relate. Humans, we have a powerful herd mentality. We're easily swayed or influenced. We sometimes fall for the latest trend or fad. We're easily distracted. We can be led astray, much like sheep. How many of us go to the supermarket intending to buy a pint of milk or some bread, and we come back with a bar of Galaxy, uh, some cookies, and some Ben and Jerry's because they were on offer? That's definitely been me. And there are times when I think, I'm just going to pop onto Facebook you know, to check out what's the latest on the Redeemer community page. Cheeky plug there. And in no time at all, I've ended up scrolling through and I'm watching Britain's Got Talent clips. Or maybe for you, it's funny cat videos. Humans are easily distracted. We are easily influenced and we can easily be led astray. We are in need of a guide. We are in need of someone to follow and help us as we navigate life. We are in need of a shepherd. Someone who we can follow who will protect us, care for us, and invites us to walk with him. Thankfully, the Bible gives us a solution. 
In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He is the shepherd we need and we can depend on so we don't go astray. So, if you've got your Bibles, will you turn with me to John 10? At this point, I'm going to ask for my helpers. My handy helpers are going to come up. Uh, We're going to unpack what we can learn about the Lord as our shepherd from these verses. Um, So if you want to read along in your Bibles, or we've got the uh, the verses up on the screen, uh, there should be a microphone. Amazing. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, So we're going to read from John 10, and this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, who are the religious people at the time, revealing his character to us. Thank you, Daniel. Very very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep who have All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find a pasture. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So, when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then, the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and the sheep know me, just as the father knows me, and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not these sheep in the pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Amazing. Guys, thank you so much for being willing to help. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, my trusted helpers. So, what can we learn from these passages about the Lord being our shepherd? Well, we see from these verses that Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd in verse 11 and 14. He says he calls his own sheep by name in verse 3. And again in verse 14, he says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus, the shepherd, knows us intimately. He calls us by name. He knows each of us, his sheep, personally. He is the one who tends to us, his flock, with love and devotion. If you think about it, a shepherd doesn't stay far away in an ivory tower, detached from life. Rather, the shepherd is constantly engaged in the real world with the sheep, seeking water, shade, and fodder for them. He is concerned with the needs of the flock and makes sure that they are cared for. He leads them, verse 3 says. He leads them out. And in verse 4, he goes on ahead of them. He is the one they follow. He goes on ahead to make sure the path is safe and ensure that they are protected from any oncoming danger. And if danger does come, which we know it will, verse 11, which Oliver read for us, says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrifices himself for the good of his sheep. And ultimately, Jesus is the one who has laid down his life for us, for each and every one of us. 
We were destined for hell because we chose to go our own way down a dangerous path. But he paid the price. He laid down his life for us in our place. 1 John 16 says this, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The shepherd who laid down his life for you, only to take it back up again, hallelujah, is inviting you to draw close to him, to walk with him, to let him shepherd you, to guide you, to tend to your needs. And this is his invitation to each one of us today. Jesus came not to tend healthy, strong sheep, but those who are sick, broken, diseased, and weak. Now, if you look around, we are not a congregation of fleecy, fluffy, clean, and white sheep. Maybe sometimes we pretend to be, but many of us are a mess, me included. Some are sick, many of us are weak, broken spiritually. Some of us are facing real pain in our lives. We are in need of a shepherd. In Luke 5, when Jesus was asked, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answers them with, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This world is filled with sheep that need a shepherd, a good shepherd. And I'm here to tell you today, Jesus is a good shepherd. Can I get an amen? In Luke 15, Jesus tells us a parable of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. He goes on to say he would leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Family, I want to join with heaven today and rejoice over one sinner or more who repents. If there is one person who turns from their ways and comes back to the Lord, the good shepherd, I will be rejoicing. A few weeks ago at the More Together conference, Isabel Barker gave her life to the Lord, and we celebrate that. And in a few weeks, let's, yeah, we can applaud that. And in a few weeks, we are going to be baptizing at least two of our youth, which is super exciting. So, the fourth thing we get from this passage is a promise of pasture and life to the full. Verse 9, which Tim read, says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now, I don't know about you, but I want life and life to the full. And it's at this point I want to look at Psalm 23, which you can turn to, arguably one of the most famous psalms. This was written by a shepherd, someone who had spent many times caring for herds of sheep. And as we know from his life before he encountered Goliath, he took care of his father's sheep and goats. And when a lion or a bear came to steal a lamb from the flock, he went after it with a club and rescued it from its mouth. He said that if the animal turned on him, he would catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Now, I don't have a similar story like Tom shared the other week ago about a cat, but I do think we can agree that David was pretty fierce and a formidable shepherd, that he would go after these wild animals and put himself in harm's way to protect his sheep. David practiced warding off wolves before he faced Goliath. Have you ever thought about that? It's a great challenge to us to think about what are we practicing in the waiting? What are we doing when no one is around? 
behind closed doors? How are we preparing ourselves to face the world's challenges? So, here we have David, who is pretty qualified and well-versed in what a shepherd is, saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, let's be honest. Who, when they read these verses, immediately pictures something like this? And it's a lovely picture. Very serene, beautiful, peaceful. But we have to remember, as one commentator puts it, the only reason we can lie down in green pastures is because Jesus lay down in the dust of death for us. We only find rest and refreshment for our souls because Jesus found no rest when he bore the punishment which we deserved. We can only eat and drink from green pastures and quiet waters because he bore our thirst. The freedom we receive is only because of what Jesus has done. We can only fear no evil in the valley of the shadow of death because Jesus has passed that way before us and defeated death before we get there. We can only sing about the Lord being our shepherd because he first became the sheep who was slaughtered in our place. Not a very nice picture compared to that, but what a savior and what a shepherd. Let me ask you, do you know the Lord as your shepherd in this way? Are you being shepherded by God? The reason we can go about life without anxiety, worry of danger, worry of the future, is because the Lord is our shepherd watching over us. And for some in the room, you'll not experienced this before. Maybe you're going through life thinking, you don't need a shepherd. You've got everything pretty sorted on your own. For some, maybe your earthly experience is not one of being cared for and looked after as a shepherd would. This is part of my story. I grew up in quite a complex, dysfunctional family where often the needs of me and my siblings were not met. And at times, we witnessed violence and abusive behavior, and it was scary. This may be your experience, and I know some of your stories, and they are worse than mine. Thankfully, it's not a competition. <laughs> but what I want to say today is that through it all, the Lord has been my shepherd. I have looked to him for guidance, for comfort, for nurture, for wisdom, for leadership, and he's never failed. And he can provide the same for you too. Maybe today there will be some here, you're wandering through, not sure where to turn, what to do, helpless like a sheep that has gone astray. Today is an invitation for you to know the good shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. Now, I believe that we should first and foremost be shepherded by the Lord, but we can also be shepherded by each other. I know for me, not growing up in a Christian household, I was provided for in many ways, which I'm grateful for, but spiritually, I could not depend on my parents to teach me the ways of the Lord. I had to look to others to shepherd me. And I can look back at my life and I can see numerous people who have helped me and guided me through highs and lows in my life. Look around. There'll be people here who have shepherded you, who have helped you in desperate times, who you've depended on. And there are people here that may need you to shepherd them. Can I ask you a question? If you're a Christian here today, put your hand up if you're currently being discipled. 
What I mean by that is that you have someone who is actively helping you grow in your faith, is seeking, speaking into your life, is keeping you accountable, pointing you towards God, caring for you, and is like a shepherd to you. Okay, a few. Let me encourage you. I've sought out shepherds to help and guide me, and it has helped me immeasurably. And as you look around this room, there'll be people that you can seek out to help you in life. We need to support each other, and we need to be discipling each other. Maybe today is the day to ask someone to disciple you, or even for you to get alongside someone else and encourage them. Okay, the third question. How do you know that you are his? How do you know whether he is your shepherd? We hear his voice. Verse 4 says, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And verse 27 says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. How are you at hearing the voice of God? Often we're waiting for a big, booming voice to appear to us, like Mufasa in The Lion King, one of my favorite Disney films. But you come to realize he often speaks in other ways, primarily through his word. He speaks through others, through dreams. And he does speak directly to his followers if we listen. I found that when I was around fellow believers and and listened... I heard him speaking to me, and it was confirmed by others praying and sharing similar things to what I was thinking. I was really encouraged last week in the prayer meeting before the service. Al reminded me about how God spoke to Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, we read about God appearing to Elijah. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then... A great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard the Lord speaking. It is more often than not, God speaks through a gentle whisper. Can I encourage you, if you struggle to hear God's voice, why don't you come along to one of our evening prayer meetings over the next three Sundays? These are fantastic opportunities to encounter the risen Lord and to hear his voice. It's a time for us to seek him as our shepherd, to guide us. As we draw near to him, he promises to draw near to us so we can listen to his voice and how he wants to shepherd us. The second way we know that we are his is we follow him. We don't follow strangers, as it says in verse 5. In fact, we run away from them. Verse 6 says, if you're not following the good shepherd, then I want to ask you, who are you following? We must flee from things that we know are pulling our attention influencing us in a negative way, things that are leading us astray, leading us away from the shepherd. Being surrounded by people of faith, and particularly when it's in a church, in life group, or in discipleship, will help you to not follow other voices trying to pull your attention. And finally, the final way we know he is our shepherd is that we must accept Jesus as our saviour. In verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. For all of us here today, that is what is on offer, to have life and life to the full. This is what we get when we follow the good shepherd. And finally, what should we do about this? My final question, this is linked to the challenge that verse 16 brings. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. 
and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Friends, family, there are more sheep to be gathered. Jesus is on a mission to bring sheep that are not in his pen. And this is our mission too. We are being sent into the world to spread the good news and to gather more sheep. We have Alpha coming up, a fantastic opportunity, as we've already heard, to bring sheep that are not in his pen and allow them the opportunity to meet Jesus and to hear his voice. Can I encourage you to start thinking about who you can invite? Maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, a colleague, maybe a family member. And if you're here today and you want to know more about Jesus, the good shepherd, then can I encourage you to go along too? I know it's not always easy to go into the world and share your faith. We can face a lot of opposition. But we must remember what Jesus says in Matthew 10. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. It's a warning. There are wolves out there. We need to be on guard and be prepared because we are in a battle. We need a good shepherd to protect us not a hired hand who, when, we see the, when he sees the wolf coming, abandons the sheep and runs away, allowing the wolf to attack and scatter the sheep. I'm sure we all know people who, would be, who are or would be terrible in a crisis. Maybe they panic, maybe they get super flustered, maybe they'd run away and hide. When I was at university, I worked part-time in a restaurant as a waiter, and one Sunday, a lady came in to eat with her husband and started choking on a piece of meat. Now, I had no idea what to do. I'd heard of the Heimlich maneuver, but was in no way qualified to administer it. So I started to panic. And when I looked around to see what my boss, the, the manager of the restaurant, was doing, hoping that he would be able to provide some leadership and he'd know what to do, where was he? He was hiding behind the bar, panicking, shouting at us to ring an ambulance or do something. Thankfully, her husband got up and he did the Heimlich maneuver on her and managed to dislodge the piece of meat, thank goodness. But I realized in that moment, we did not have the leader we needed to help us in that moment. Why did I share that story? Jesus is not the kind of boss who runs away in a crisis. He's not a hired hand who flees at the first sign of danger. When we are surrounded by wolves, he stays with the flock. He protects the flock. He leads and helps us, even putting his life on the line to save us. So be comforted that as we go out into the world, we have a good shepherd with us at all times. So, as I come to the end of what I want to share today, can I ask the band if you'd like to come back up? We are going to come back to worship in a minute. The worship this morning was incredible, and I think it, it's only right that we continue to worship the Lord as our shepherd, to praise him for all that he's done. If you want to receive prayer or anything from anything that's been shared this morning, then at the prayer banner at the back, we'll have some leaders, some ministry leaders, who would be there and love to pray with you. So to summarize, why do we need a shepherd? The Bible teaches us we all, like sheep, have gone astray. What do we know about the shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd, who we can depend on so we don't go astray. He knows his sheep. He leads them out. He laid down his life for his sheep. Each of us are in the fold because our gracious, merciful, loving shepherd has come after us and found us. How do you know whether you're his? His sheep hear his voice. We follow him instead of other things. We turn from evil and follow Jesus and receive eternal life. And now... He is sending us out like sheep among wolves to share the good news. So be prepared for opposition. But remember that we have Jesus to help us in our mission to bring the lost sheep to meet the good shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. Can I ask you to stand?
I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you go before us. Lord, that you've made a way for us. We thank you that you laid down your life for us. Lord, you made a way through the wilderness for us to be made right with God. We thank you. We worship you. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your love, your care of us, Lord. We thank you that you are fighting our battles and you are never far away. You are a shepherd that cares for us intimately. Help us, Lord, to follow you, to cast off everything else, to look to you, the one true shepherd, to help us as we, as we seek to bring the good news to many others that need to hear it in Colchester and beyond. We love you, Lord. We love you that you are our good shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. Let's worship.